Okay, uh, let's get started. I'm, uh, my name is Melanie Kamet. I'm a professor in the government department here at Harvard. I'm delighted to welcome you back. And also, I am the moderator of this uh, panel of distinguished uh, participants. Let me just briefly introduce them. Um, we're going to take about 15 minutes each in the interest of time so that we can leave some time for Q&A. We're getting a bit of a, a late start. Um, our, first panel, our first panelist on this panel, Understanding Developments in Europe's Southern Neighborhood, uh, which I think we touched on a little bit, actually, in the last panel. Um, uh, our first panelist is uh, Dr. Sheikh Mohammed Sabah Asalem Sabah, who is uh, chairman of the board of the uh, Sabah Foundation and is the uh, former deputy prime minister and foreign minister of Kuwait. Um, our, our, uh, maybe we'll go in the order of the panelists here. Our uh, second speaker is Dr. Hedi Larabi, who is a visiting scholar, the Kuwait Foundation visiting scholar at the uh, Middle East Initiative at the Kennedy School here at Harvard. And he is also the uh, former Minister of Economic Infrastructure and Sustainable Development and an economic advisor to the government of Tunisia. Um, our third speaker is uh, Minister Miguel Moratinos, who is the EU or the former EU special representative in the Middle East peace process and uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation of Spain. And last but not least is uh, Minister Luis Amado, who is uh, uh, currently serving as a professor at the University of Lisbon, is also the chairman of a bank in Portugal, and the former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Defense of Portugal. So uh, without further ado, let's start with uh, Dr. Sabah. I don't know if you, you want, want to sit I here. Don't know. What, what, the if you want to stay here, that's fine. <laughs> or what, what, whatever you prefer. All right. I'll see you. Um, follow the previous uh, speakers. Um, First of all, I would like to uh, extend my greetings to uh, my fellow Jewish friends for the Yom Kippur, and also for my fellow Muslims for uh, Eid al-Adha. So the greetings for both. The, I have 15 minutes, so I, I'll try to be punctual. Uh, the year was 1815. The place was Vienna. And the deal was the creation of a Christian Europe in exchange of absolute Ottoman rule over the Arab world. At least this is how we, the Arabs, viewed the outcome of the Congress of Vienna of 1815. Now, fast forward 200 years later exactly. 2015, and the place is again Vienna. And again, Western powers meeting another major Middle Eastern power and reaching a deal. Now, the nature of this deal is quite ambiguous. The Iranian interpretation of this deal is fundamentally different from the Western nar narrative. So who do we believe? Now, this is, I'm, I'm reminded about now, a popular story in our part of the world about this deal is about this uh, Western wealthy art collector who, a long time ago, he went to Iran uh, searching for an ancient artifacts. So he was walking in the streets of uh, the bazaars of uh, Tehran, and all of a sudden his jaw dropped and his heart almost, because he saw a second century pot uh, and this shop, shopkeeper pouring water in this pot for a stray dog to come and drink from this second century pot. So immediately this art collector, this wealthy Western art collector, he said, ah, this shopkeeper, he doesn't have idea about the value of this pot. So uh, he devised a plan to, uh, to acquire this pot at a bargain price. So he walks in and he asked the shopkeeper, I want to buy this dog. So the shopkeeper said, OK, it's a, you can buy it. He said, I'll, I'll pay $500. He said, no, this is a $2,000 dog. 
So they start bargaining, they settle on $1,000. So he paid the $1,000, he took the dog. As he walks away, he stopped and he turned and he said, well, how about this pot? Uh, you know, I don't have a pot. Uh, th this dog seems to like this pot. Uh, why don't you send me this pot? The shopkeeper said, no, I'm sorry, this pot is not for sale. <laughs> so they start arguing and there's bargaining and he starts uh, you know, raising the price. I'll pay you 1000 5000 $10,000. And this shopkeeper continued to say, sir, this pot is not for sale. So this art collector said, well, how come you sell me this lousy dog, this ugly looking dog, uh, and you are not selling me this lousy pot? And the shopkeeper said, well, sir, if it wasn't for this pot, I would never have been able to sell. Uh, I, I mean, if, if it wasn't for this pot, I would have never been able to sell a stray, a stray dog every day for people like him. <laughs> <laughs> now, the moral point of the story is that the Western art collector bought something that he doesn't need, and the Iranian, uh, the Persian uh, shopkeeper sold something that he doesn't own. Now, the predominant view in the region is that the American administration and President Obama personally maintains that the nuclear deal with Iran uh, will act as a prelude for a mega regional realignment that will enlist Iran's cooperation in combating extremism and terrorism led by ISIS. Iran's help in the American perspective was needed and sought after. The Iranians, with their shrewd bargaining techniques and strategic patience, exploited this urge and extracted concessions as much as they can. Both the uh, Obama administration and Iran have argued that the nuclear deal will open a new horizons of cooperation over the mutual issues. Iran's foreign minister, Mohammad Zarif, maintained, and I quote, good nuke deal could lead to a cooperation in fight against terrorism, end quote. He repeated, he repeated the same line during his recent visit to Kuwait and Qatar just only two months ago calling for cooperation in common interest to fight extremism, terrorism, and sectarianism, and thwart threats and challenges. On the other hand, the GCC states, that's the Gulf Cooperation Council states, narrative is diametrically opposite to that of the US. The GCC have maintained that the nuclear deal with its unconditional cash windfall will embolden Iran. It will inject will in Iran's leadership psychic and cash in its coffers that will be translated into bold and provocative actions. And if you track Iran's statements, actions, and narrative since the nuclear deal was signed, you cannot miss the euphoric, emboldened, and defiant Iran. From the GCC perspective, the nuclear deal has ended Iran's status as a pariah state, has put to rest the notion of regime change, and has overlooked Iran's infamous role as the leading state sponsor of terrorism and brushed aside Iran's abysmal human rights record. What, what irks the GCC states is how the nuclear deal has overlooked Iran's proxies role Hezbollah and company, of fomenting sectarianism from Afghanistan to Lebanon and in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. This is evident in Iran's post-nuclear deal behavior, its bellicose statements and action of defiance. Two weeks after the nuclear accords was signed, the Bahraini Interior Ministry announced the uncovering of a Bahraini cell that was trained and armed by Iran's revolutionary guards to carry out terrorism acts in Bahrain. At the same time, Iran's supreme leader continued his provocative statements no. of pledging full support to the oppressed Bahraini people. A week later, terrorists' <coughs> explosives killed two Bahraini policemen, and a, a Saudi policeman was killed in eastern province in Saudi Arabia. And just last month, Kuwait, my country, uncovered the largest terrorist plot in recent history with links to Hezbollah 
and Iran. These belligerent Iranian acts against the GCC states, coupled with Khamenei's stance that Iran would not change its narrative and policy in the region, and Zarif's blunt argument in, in Kuwait that, quote, change should come from those countries that seek conflict and war in the region, end of quote, have much to say about Tehran's attitude. The US argument is that as Iran will have a stake and is part of a solution, the regional crisis and conflict will stop being part of the problem. But is this realistic conclusion? There is little confidence that Iran, which is engaged in a cold war with the GCC neighbors, will use its leverage and influence in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen to bring its proxies to their sense to, to their senses and stop under, undermining the stability of those states and societies. To confirm this, just recently, General Petraeus said, and I quote, in fact, I would argue that the foremost threat to Iraq, long-term stability, and broader regional equilibrium is not the Islamic State. Rather, it is Shia militias, many backed by and some guided by Iran, end of quote. That's what General Petraeus said just recently. To be sure, the most effective ad used by ISIS recruiting blog is a picture of General Qasem Soleimani. He is the commandant of the Al-Quds force of the Revolutionary Guards. And the ad, I don't know whether I, any of you have seen the ad, it's, it's popular, on the, it went viral in the, uh, the ad shows Qasem Soleimani standing on Little Hill, hands on the hip, overlooking the valley of uh, Ramadi in Iraq. And the caption underneath that poster saying that, uh, do you want to kick this criminal out of Iraq? Uh, eh? If you want to kick that criminal out of Iraq, contact, and they have uh, uh, an address. And this is how they are recruiting uh, fighters. Uh, this is the ISIS recruiting agencies. That's why the Iraqi army uh, is totally demoralized. About $30 billion has been spent on building that army, and now it's just totally demoralized because of the presence of overwhelming presence of Iranian militias on uh, on the ground in Baghdad. And also more than 6,000 sorties, uh, air sorties, have done barely little in stopping ISIS from spreading. Uh, Ramadi is, is now part of, uh, the, under the control of ISIS, and Tedmur <coughs> in Syria is also under the control of ISIS. I'm afraid that the recent uh, deployment of Russian troops in Syria will set the stage for a recreation of the last century Afghan theater with its cries for jihad that transcends the civil war in Syria, which is a very serious uh, development. Finally, we can't fight and defeat ISIS with Iranian hegemonic drive in the Arab world, coupled with the deployment of Russian troops. The national security and strategic imperatives of the region and of Europe requires a new security structure that ensures respect for, uh, that ensures respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity of all nations in the region. I hope I hope we got more than an ugly dog in this uh, deal that we had with Iran. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Minister Larabi. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this very important uh, session. Uh, actually, I'm not a specialist of European studies, but I will take it from a policy maker and sort of 
operation that I have experienced, <coughs> whether when I was in a position in uh, Beirut, uh, overseeing the uh, regional department of the World Bank, working on Iraq, Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, etc., or when I was uh, a minister in Tunisia. So I will be certainly more, a little bit more technical, uh, but uh, more, less politician. So take it as uh, it is. And I will be actually in the, in the heart of the subject, complimenting uh, His Excellency uh, Mr. Mohammed. I think he's absolutely right by uh, taking the, the GCC point of view, uh, in particular in this geopolitical and the strategic deal. Uh, and I will actually concentrate myself or focus on a little, uh, I would say, a smaller <laughs> geography, which is the southern rim of, of the Mediterranean, which is actually those who had uh, sort of uh, agreements and association with the EU. And I will talk a little bit about the uh, neighborhood, what I call the European neighborhood policy, and uh, how we see it. And I will talk just a little bit about uh, how we assess it and what was the implication, and how actually these somehow, in my humble view, with respect to my European friends, this failed neighborhood policy got to exactly this you know, humanitarian crisis where we are. Because the leadership and the strategic position that we were expecting from Europe for decades has never actually, uh, in a way, materialized. And that is what I wanted to talk a little bit. Now, technically, what was this neighborhood policy? Mainly, if you look at the over, I would say, the higher goal was how can we have a southern rim that is a little bit stable so that our borders in the south are secure? So the real issue, and I think in the first panel raised this issue, the security issue. So everything was driven by how can we be in a way in a sort of a secure uh, environment and give a little bit on do what we can do to our neighbor in the south. I'm sorry to be uh, simplifying these type of things, but that's how the perception and how the debate on especially the policy dialogue with Europe has been actually uh, going for uh, decades. Now, that's why, and that explains somehow, the good relationships that they have for years with the authoritarians and with the dictators. So as long as they are actually keeping the border secure, and as long as they were controlling this migration in spite of the economic hard hardship in most of this country, that's fine. And uh, regrettably, and we saw it today, <coughs> and we saw it two years ago, actually, that this policy kind of reached its limits, and now uh, we are in another uh, world, and the change that we have, we really <coughs> change it. So the policy, the, that's the goal. How do we do to achieve this goal? Two things. One, on the political stream, it was about, can you democratize a little bit upon a, a, your society and have a little bit of uh, rule of law? And the other, and let's help you develop some civil society. That's mainly about the type of uh, policies that they were uh, trying to, uh, uh, um, in a way, uh, in, impact or impress uh, in the region. And the, on the economic side, free trade. And the free trade, why it's free trade is very important, so we will help you bring t some technical assistance and some financial assistance so that you can open up, harmonize your rules and regulation, and let's have a bigger market, 150, uh, except from the Gulf. If I add the Gulf, we are more than 200. But actually, I'm talking about this uh, part of the uh, Mediterranean, 150 million people. It could be a good market, even if the economy were not that much developed and the person experience is not higher. But it could be actually a good deal for uh, the Europeans. Now, the political economy to open up and to have a free trade in this region, in many of these countries, is not that simple because of the authorities bargain that you have out there. And of course, the connected uh, uh, circle of uh, business communities who also would like to defend, not only would like, who were defending really their interests. So there was a kind of mismatch. But the Europeans were smart enough. They know this. So we go for free trade, but at the pace you can do. You know, this is not something that we really will be pushing for. Uh, and that actually started early in 1995. So you can imagine in, from 1995 to, for instance, 2010, where we didn't achieve one single democratization or one single rule of law in any of these countries. I'm talking about actually the, the countries Morocco, Tunisia, uh, Jordan was actually part of this uh, 
policy neighborhood, uh, Lebanon, of course, and Syria was part of it. So Libya was the kind of uh, singularity in that uh, sometimes it's in the, in the deal, sometimes it's not in there. You know how Gaddafi can change his mind every time. So it was not really the Europeans, but <laughs> the country it, uh, itself. So now what were the instruments? The instruments were somehow, I would simplify them, of course there are too many, but mainly let's have bilateral agreements but or bilateral association and if by chance we can have a sort of sub-regional deal, why not? But we have never had any sub-regional because Arab countries on that part of the world have never agreed on anything among themselves. Well, first of all, they have different uh, policies, they have economic policies, but they have their different politics. And most of the time, if you take some uh, open economies like Tunisia, Morocco, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, etc., they were kind of in a competition or rather than in a complementarity in terms of economic activities and uh, model. Uh, the rest are, take Algeria and Syria, they are more of a state type of economy and there is no need uh, really to debate or to discuss with the, 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 uh, the Europeans or even with the Tunisian and the Moroccan because they have a little bit of uh, open. Now the financial instruments which is extremely important but that's where you kind of oil a little bit that uh, mechanic and have the instruments to have uh, some impact. It was somehow like four billion dollars, uh, no sorry, euro per, per year two uh, like in the form of uh, grants and two in the form of loans by the European Investment Bank. But in reality, more than 80% of this money would go to the Eastern European countries. So if you look at what the, the amount of money that went to these countries as an incentive was less than 0.1% of the budget of this country. So it actually, and that's where you see these policies, whether they are congruent with the uh, uh, higher objective or we are misaligned because the incentive was not there. And I think the incentive more for the authoritarian to remain and to be kind of, so, so that's the, the real bargain actually. They were a double bargain, bargain with their societies, but the bargain with the external uh, power that, uh, that were there anyway. But that's something uh, I'm sure Melanie is much more qualified in terms of geopolitical economy things than uh, uh, me. Uh, when we look now a little bit and very quickly on the results of this, I think it's, it's uh, clear in terms of harmonization, just a little bit with Morocco and Tunisia. And yet, if you look at the complexity of the policy reforms that these countries have to really to kind of carry out, it's absolutely horrendous. 400 regulations that need to be uh, actually harmonized with the Europe just for trade. Now, whenever you touch a trade, you find some other regulation that, that are tied in, and then we go, and, and I remember in Tunisia when I counted them were more than 650 regulations. So actually we didn't do that much because it was too complex, and we didn't So why. Why should we do it as long as we are trading? You look at the impact on trade, in spite of all these uh, somehow reforms, yet actually trade of Europe with this uh, southern dream is all around 4% for the last 10 years. So there is really no progress. Of course, if you take it country by country, you will find that Tunisia and Morocco actually increased their trade with Morocco. However, it's really concentrated in two dangerous areas. One, in terms of countries. So we are very dependent on three countries, which is uh, France, Italy, and Spain. Mostly this is 80% of the trade. But the other thing is we are in a low added value activities. So this is not something that would help you actually have the structural transformation that you need and the jobs that you need. And the jobs is fundamental, especially for young uh, nations and young demographics, as we all know in the Arab world. And that's part of the problem that we have. So uh, economically, we didn't achieve much. Uh, politically, you know, until 2010, there was no such a democratic or kind of uh, human rights environment that have been created, a little bit here and there, but actually people came out at the end of 2010 and uh, early 2011 and took their fate in their hands and they changed the whole thing. So the dynamics has totally changed. Now, where is Europe? What is the type of leadership that we were expecting from Europe to take a strong position during this actually Arab appraising and give us a little bit of guidance or give us a sense of what Europe wanted to do. Actually, what they did, they came up with what a new kind of added add on to their uh, old policies, which is the more for more. 
But that more for more meaning that if you do more policy reforms and if you do more on the democratic uh, front, then we will give you more resources. But in a period of transition, how much can we do? And we see today the results of this appraising. Actually, you have only one single country, and we are still struggling with that transition. So the rest of the country went down. Now, Europe actually today has in <coughs> its south a very kind of difficult neighborhood, extremely difficult. We don't even know where these countries are going to go. Many countries actually, countries are disintegrating. Instability is everywhere. So that higher goal of security now is really in danger, in serious danger. And this flow of uh, actually economic migrant and refugees will continue whatever Europe will do because the situation in the region is actually deteriorating. Economics is going down. If you take growth in most of these military and southern military countries, went actually down by half, dropped by half. We are creating much, much less jobs than before 2010. Before 2010. The fiscal situation of all countries, especially non-oil importers, declined. There has no such a kind of fiscal space, narrow fiscal space in the history of this country. So very serious public finance problems, so we cannot have a sort of stimulating packages to do to create jobs. Serious balance of payment and balance, actually, a, 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 a trade balance. Serious unemployment, especially for youth. And of course, difficult, very weakened state to control the border and to control this flow of migration. Hence the need for Europe, really, and that's, I, I like very much, actually very topical, the, the title, Europe future, look also south, and let's build together that future, because without revisiting, amending these neighborhood policies, where you provide the strategic, the, I think the, the problem when I look at the dysfunctions of some of the European institution, and the, the look at what happened in Greece. It, I, I don't think that they will do much even in our neighbor, but we have really to work together and bring some strategic vision to the region, and in particular work together on revisiting these policies and put something that we would hope, but in terms of concrete policies that we agree upon and not these policies that are done in Brussels without any consultation and precipitation of the countries themselves. And the, the most important the priority today is security, security and fight against terrorism. Second is the jobs for youth. And third, which is in my humble view extremely important, is really to sit down and see how we can stabilize the region. Without stabilizing the region and without a strong political position on a number of issues like Syria and the rest and ISIS, we are not going to make it because we are all, regrettably, we will all suffer and the economic and social cost would be very high for us. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is Minister Moratino from you. Spain. Good morning. <laughs> Let me uh, start by expressing my <coughs> thanks to the European Center of Study of Harvard. It's a privilege, honor uh, to be in Harvard. Mm -hmm. You can imagine for me it's the first time. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit impressed by the audience, uh, and uh, <coughs> you know, already the two speakers have uh, presented, uh, you know, the very complex situation and challenge that we have in this so-called southern part of Europe. Uh, we are not pigs, you know, hmm? as we call sometime in Europe. We are the southerners. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So I have a good news and, and a bad news. The good news is that uh, Mediterranean is back in European politics. That is good news, because in policy, what you have to win is the agenda. If you don't have the agenda, well, I will explain later on how we try in our dear Europe to mobilize and to prevent what was coming and now, my dear friend, we are with the bad news. We are leading to a catastrophe. So the good news is that at least we are taking care, or we should take care of what is going on. And we are not more the periphery. 
It's not a question of Italy or Spain or Greece or Cyprus to take care of these uh, immigrants. That is what well, you have to, to deal. External borders. So that's part of the external borders. So that the South who have to take care. No. Now he got to the Calais, to the British island. They go to Hungary, to Austria, to Germany. And then our comrades, European comrades, wake up and say, well, mm -hmm. we should do something. Well, thank you. Good news. Bad news. We are in a total disaster. Crisis, conflict, from the humanitarian point of view, from the security point of view, from the demographic <laughs> point of view, from the economic point of view. And so we have to try to at least solve or try to solve this uh, complex uh, reality if we want really as Europeans to overcome this very difficult challenge. So it was a surprise for us what is going on now? I will say no. For certain of us, it was not a surprise. We tried modestly the southern neighbors to create some mechanism and our dear professor, the minister Larby, have uh, correctly, and I fully agree, and I will support his criticism. While well, we had a chance to launch the Barcelona process, Barcelona Declaration, fantastic initiative. Well, not because I been part of that, that's probably the reason. <laughs> <laughs> but because it was an innovative formula, I mean, the people who are uh, interested in diplomacy should take uh, the Barcelona Declaration as the first time you introduce democratization, political basket, uh, the economic and financial uh, elements, and the cultural. We have not yet it here talk about the cultural device that is producing now the West and the East with this confrontation. But as Minister Labi has said, we failed. Why we failed? First, because we were paralyzed by the Middle East affairs uh, or Israeli-Palestinian conflict that was from the heart of the new policy of uh, the Mediterranean uh, countries. And as we were not able, Europe, to engage, we tried to encapsulate the Middle East and say, well, let's not to affect the normal policy, neighborhood policy, association agreement, indicative, indicative program. And then the Palestinian Israeli will continue forever fighting. <coughs> it's not possible. And what is going on now, and I will come back on the world, refugee, refugee. And what happened about Syria? You have to solve yeah. Syria. You have to solve the Palestinian Israeli issue. You have to address the real issues and not hide behind certain smoke screen of uh, symptoms of the problems. You have to go to the route, and Europeans should have done. So if we fell from the democratization. We didn't help uh, the reform policy in the Maghreb countries. We fell on the financial package. Yes, Mr. Cole and Mr. Gonzalez make a deal. Four times for the East, and one euro for the South. It's OK. It was a good balance, no? At this time, but when the East is already a member of the European Union, you should increase where the problems will come. No way. We create in order to balance Eastern partnership. And the old neighborhood become a new neighborhood. And OK, it's very important. I don't want to interact with Eastern and South. But really, what is much more complex and much more challenging, we are seeing that, 
is not the East with Ukraine, Russia. I know we could uh, debate, and I will demonstrate to you in terms of interest of Europe today, interest, real interest. What at stake is much more on the South than in the East. Mm. But it's an internal debate we have with Europeans. And we Southerners, we lost the debate. And then suddenly, Arab Spring, we were very happy. Oh, Arab becomes Democrats. Oh, they are like us. They are going to fulfill our dreams. They are going to be, finally, you know, go for elections. Welcome to the club. It lasted two months, three months. As soon as we have elections, then there was some uh, results were not convenient. <laughs> then uh, the Americans consider that political Islam is the only way for these countries. And we grew up with that we are the neighbors, that we know. Don't tell think tanks think tank in the UK or in France, even in Spain, with all my respect, or in Italy. We don't know what is going on in the Arab world. In the, of course we know. But politicians, myself and others, we are hiding to the US policy towards the region that is a policy to the United States. He's defending his interests. To a certain extent, the interests of the United States are not the interests of Europeans, of the Arab world. It doesn't mean we cannot dialogue and have an agreement. And then we suddenly, our spring collapsed. We started the, the intervention in the whole area, come from here and there, Libya, mm -hmm. Egypt, Tunisia, the first, and Syria. And today, we see, I don't have time to go with more detail, that, well, we have a uh, Sheikh Mohammed Sabat has already said what the GDC think about the Iran pact because they affect their life. They are the ones who are in first line to be the consequences of any arrangement. And so they, they raise their hand and they want to express their view. And we Europeans, at least I think, what is going on in Syria should interest us. I know. Is Russia and the United States who are going to make peace in Syria? Is Secretary of State Kerry and Mr. Lavrov who meet and decide what is going to be the next step in Syria? And what are the Europeans? We Europeans are swallowing the refugees, swallowing the insecurity problem, thinking that uh, Syria is going to be solved like that, like a magic wand. What is the European diplomacy? Mm. What is the Europeans trying to shape the vision? And that is what I, I want to conclude. Next year, <coughs> and Sheikh Mohammed mentioned the Berlin Congress, 1815, I will mention 1916. Next year will be 100 years, not 200 years. Two European diplomats, Sykes, Pico, mm. decide to draw the map of the Middle East. And my dear friend, in 2016, there will not be a French or British diplomat who is going to plan the new card of uh, the Middle East. And it shouldn't be, because it's time for the Arabs themselves to decide what are the future. It will be for the Europeans and the Mediterranean ourselves to decide what is the future. Of course, we have to have a good relation with the United States. Of course, we have to change views and uh, stabilize the region, as Mr. Larry said. Of course. But at least we have to have a common view. Are the Arabs and North Africa country and Europeans wants to be together and build together their future or not? 
because maybe at this stage, they're not interested. They prefer to go to the African, or they prefer to go to the Chinese. What are these Europeans? You say, Mr. Lai, we are waiting for some child. Yes. The crisis today is not what is going to be, what is the mechanism. We are going now to review the neighborhood policy in the lines that you criticized. And we hope I produce a paper, we send to Mr. Margherini. I hope she will take some elements to change the philosophy and the approach. But the first condition we have is either if we want to live together, if we want to have a political vision, what vision? What is going to be the new Middle East? How the European interests, the Arab interests, and the American others' interests can be together? So that has to be the new element of our di diplomacy. And it can be done because the conflict is extremely complex. You mentioned. But we mentioned, uh, Minister Mohammed Sabak mentioned the Iranian pact, the new, let's say, inverted commas, adversary, Iran, in the region. Well, taking the example of the uh, United States and the Soviet Union, and President Kennedy, there is a lot of fellows from Kennedy School here, <laughs> a fantastic president. You don't think at this time there was not a military, ideological, economic confrontation between the Soviet and the United States, much more conflict, much more difficult than what we can have the West with ISIS and Islamic uh, radical it's not, no, it was not much more difficult to really settle a model of security, collective security system for the whole region. How we transform the Soviet Union to become <coughs> Russia Federation with, well, with certain difficulties, but at least uh, all the Eastern European countries recuperate, recuperate democracy, freedom, and um, liberties who did through diplomacy, through diplomacy, and they call for Helsinki Act, and they say, well, let's have a recognition of each other, but at the same time, <coughs> you have to behave and perform on human rights. And they was starting to move and change the society. There was no more bombs, and no more in military intervention there was diplomacy. So what we need now is a new system, a new mechanism that should be curated all together in order that we can live in peace and, and justice forever in, in this part of the world. But that is our responsibility as Europeans, as Mediterranean, as Arab, and of course, Everybody outside is welcome. <coughs> but let's take our responsibility to face our own future. That should be the next stage. And no way for any more model coming from European Union. The next to call for a new Barcelona process mm -hmm. or oh, too long a speech of President uh, Sarkozy, no. What you are waiting for, Europeans, my dear Larby? You should not wait anymore. You should call for what you want. Enough with uh, pret a porter models that have been con conceived by uh, Cicot, Parsaic, and Picot. No. It should be a fantastic, a brilliant Arab diplomat who have intelligence to create a new mechanism of peace and security. And then, all together, we will make peace and, and live with this fantastic word, a Spanish word, that is convivencia, that means live together. It has no translation, 
but it's going to be a new term for the future terminology of this. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, our final speaker on the panel is Minister Amado. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's a privilege to be with you. Uh, thinking uh, of what we are living now in Europe, um, I have in my mind a Chinese proverb uh, that says, uh, uh, wish you to live in an uh, interesting era. I think we live in, in a, an interesting era, definitely. And uh, I think that we need to be aware of the dangers of the challenges that we face in the near future, which will not be only challenges for Europeans. We should be uh, sure of that. It will be the kind of challenges that humanity has had in the past. So for my fellow Americans, forget the <coughs> Pacific for a while. Concentrate a little bit in what is going on in Europe and in the Middle East and in the Mediterranean. Because in the near future, you will see uh, certainly uh, dynamics that will surprise all of us. Um, I just want to uh, give you some impressions which are not different from some of my colleagues. Uh, actually, we worked together during the last couple of years, so we assisted to this disruptive dynamic of relationship between the Europeans and the Arab world and the Islamic world namely after the September 11. And my, argu uh, my argument is this. In Europe, uh, we are living a very complex crisis. Uh, six years after its beginning, we still have no strategy to deal adequately with that crisis. We are in a very critical moment because we are living dynamics of fragmentation and identity fragmentation and disintegration. At the same time, we are experiencing, just to counterbalance those dynamics, new dynamics of federalization, namely in the Eurozone. It has to be. So this dialectic <coughs> between disintegration and federalization in some areas of uh, European internal uh, policy is very much uh, influenced now by the exhaustion, the external impact of this uh, geopolitical <coughs> implosion of the Middle East. Uh, Miguel used the term catastrophe. I use this term just to shake people also and to make people think and analyze what is really happening <coughs> in that side of the world. Because uh, we could uh, anticipate what is going on there, and we were not able to anticipate what was going on there. Also because Europe is very much uh, influenced by its own internal dysfunctional problem. Mm provoked by the Euro crisis, which in a certain way, uh, I fully agree with, with the, the observation made this morning by Thierry de Montréal, I think in Europe we underestimated the impact of the geopolitical uh, change determined by the end of Cold War in Europe. And uh, the response we gave to the unexpected event of the end of Soviet Union, uh, the response was uh, conformist in what respects the relations with Russia, and we didn't evaluate appropriately the dynamic of that relationship. And in a certain way, 
we cannot ignore it anymore in what respects the uh, problems that we need to fix internally. And mainly, we cannot ignore it anymore in what respects the uh, global cooperation that we need to build up if we want to address <coughs> in a rational way the challenges that we face in the Mediterranean and particularly in the Middle East. So we are confronted with a, a dynamic of uh, disintegration in European Union with geopolitical fault lines that cannot be ignored anymore. We were too much focused on the financial and economic dimensions of the crisis. Mm -hmm. We didn't evaluate the geopolitical impacts of the social and the political instability generated by the dimension of the economic and of the financial uh, problem of Europe. And uh, we need uh, absolutely to concentrate on how to repair these fault lines, which are there between creditors and debtors, north and south, also now between east and west. Uh, and we will see between France and uh, Germany one day, which will be the most critical moment of uh, European crisis. But we cannot ignore anymore that the reparation of the uh, dysfunctional uh, European Monetary Union it cannot delay the absolute need uh, of Europe to concentrate on its neighborhood, and namely in the southern neighborhood, in the Mediterranean area, and namely in the Middle East uh, situation. Uh, I agree with the analysis of uh, uh, our colleague of the panel, Adria. Uh, the uh, neighborhood policy of Europe was a disaster in the last decade. Well, foreign policy of Europe was a disaster in the last two decades. Um, and we are paying the price of uh, faults uh, we committed, and uh, we are paying the price of some of the mistakes we made uh, in our foreign policy in what respects the relations with uh, the Middle East situation and with uh, the Mediterranean as we get addressed. Uh, now, we have a huge uh, uh, <coughs> challenge in the Middle East. The Middle East is imploding uh, geopolitically. There is a new balance of power uh, that has to be found because the old uh, order is definitely uh, at stake. You have very, very dangerous fault lines uh, between the Shia and the Sunni camp, between Persia, in, uh, Iran, and the Arab world. You have uh, uh, radicals and moderates uh, challenging different perspectives. Uh, you can see in the Sunni camp a fragmentation uh, dynamic, which is becoming also very difficult for any interlocutor to um, in a rational way uh, deal with. So the dimension of the challenges that we face there are tremendous. Uh, state structures that were destroyed, some of them with the complicity of the West, if not with uh, the direct responsibility of the West. No security for society, so societies are completely in a, an unrest and disorder dynamic of populations uh, that we couldn't imagine, but which are there, and we are feeling them now for the first time very <coughs> impressively in our borders, in Europe. <coughs> and so the dimension of this uh, challenge that we face in the Middle East imposes a very urgent priority to the international community, and namely for Europe and the United States, to focus strategically, strategically, in uh, the situation in the region. Because one of the mistakes, I agree with uh, Larbi, who said that no strategic uh, relationship, no strategic vision in Europe to deal with the problems. But we cannot ignore important strategic movements that are there. And uh, the retreat of the Americans from the region. And the shift 
of the position of the hegemonic power for decades in the region is something that we cannot ignore anymore. And that's certainly one of the factors of an uncertainty and instability geopolitically in all the region. So we have this huge challenge now. How can we facilitate a new balance of power in the region without a huge war in the region between the main players which are there, uh, trying to see where they can uh, uh, find the alliances. And uh, certainly we need uh, to address uh, the consequences of this situation in the future, uh, namely given the urgency of the problem that we face, the humanitarian uh, problem in our borders, and also the impact at national level, at political level of this pressure of refugee waves in Europe, fragilizing and weakening the, in some nations, in some <coughs> countries, the balance, the political balances, the internal political balances, there are still today sustaining uh, an European uh, or pro-European policy in some of those countries, and which will be tremendously affected if this uh, pressure is not addressed appropriately at some uh, uh, national levels. And certainly, <coughs> the acceleration also of a federal mechanism, I think uh, the professor this morning addressed the issue, a certain mechanism of uh, federalization in the internal security, in some aspects of the internal security uh, of the European Union, have to be assumed by the heads of state sooner or later. Later, probably will be more uh, complicated. So. Uh, in my view, if we want to repair the, per the problems, the dysfunctional problems of European Union, we cannot ignore, ignore anymore what is going on in our borders and in our neighborhood. On the contrary, if we want to address appropriately the challenges that we face to preserve the European project, and the vision for the integration of the European continent. We cannot ignore anymore what is going on in our neighborhood. So the passive position we have in terms of foreign action in what respects the Middle East or even the relationship with Russia cannot be ignored anymore in my perspective. And we need to be very clear in the kind of uh, positions that we assume. We need definitely for the Middle East a new structure, of a new security structure. Otherwise, we will have a huge confrontation in the region. Yeah. And we need to cooperate, certainly, with the GCC countries. We need to see how to deal with the ISIS, <coughs> which is a terrorist state that we accept with a territory, with borders. When we f did fight other regimes in the past without that kind of challenging uh, positions uh, towards uh, West, we cannot ignore that. We cannot uh, solve the ISIS uh, problem without a new balancing approach to this dynamic of confrontation between Iran and the GCC and the Sunni camp. So the facilitating of the diplomatic maneuvers in the region have to be in consideration the stakeholders of the region and how we balance our a strong position, namely the United States, in giving some equilibrium to a dynamic of splitting, which is there, threatening all of us, threatening stability and peace in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the panelists. I'm convinced that if the four of them got together, we could make some progress. Um, so let me open it up to the floor, and we'll take one or two rounds of questions and then give each of the panelists a moment to respond. We're, we've got a late start, so unfortunately we won't have quite as much time for questions. Um, yes, Jaggers. Um, it's hard not to agree um, 
it's hard not to agree with everything uh, you said uh, in this panel um, about all the mistakes Europe uh, has made over the last um, you know 20 years, uh, ignoring uh, the southern neighborhood, uh, then stepping in during the Arab Spring with a very uh, wrong set of uh, policies and uh, and not having an idea how to deal with it at, at the present moment. Now, but I would like to sort of you know shift discussion a little bit in in completely other direction in response to Mr. Montreal's suggestion that uh, the trouble in the Middle East has something to do with 1989 and the enlargement of the, of, of the European Union. Uh, now, I, I think that that's quite mistaken uh, uh, point of view. Uh, I think that uh, European Union as a whole benefited in quite tremendous way uh, through the Eastern enlargement. Uh, these are the healthiest countries um, uh, in fiscal terms uh, in, uh, in the European Union. These are the countries which provided plumbers and nurses um, uh, to France and all those other uh, West European countries. Um, um, you know, argument should be made, could be made, that, um, <laughs> that uh, those uh, enlargement process really benefited uh, Europe as whole. Now, the second point, of course, is that uh, this has very little to do uh, with all the wrong policies uh, European Union had vis-a-vis -vis the South. So I would really uh, not think about linking those two uh, 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 sets of issues, Eastern enlargement and problems in the Southern neighborhood. Now, the last point I would like to make is about uh, uh, the following thing. Um, now, not only Southern neighborhood is in trouble, but Eastern neighborhood is in trouble as well. You know, there is a war going on in Ukraine, and Ukraine is twice as big as uh, Syria. You know, the moment Europe ignores Eastern neighborhood and lets the war simmer in Ukraine, we may have much bigger refugee problem uh, in Europe than we have now. So, so I think, you know, designing the policies, having more active role outside Union proper in the neighborhood must include both looking seriously at the south and looking seriously at the east. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'm going to take three more questions that I've seen and then we'll open it <coughs> up to the panel. Hi. Uh, Jeff Weintraub. I'm a visiting scholar here at CES this year. Uh, I have a number of questions and remarks, but since we have no time, I will pick on uh, Mr. Larby. And um, uh, this actually is a question. Um, you suggested that the policy that Europe followed vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East and North Africa for I mean, the period before uh, 2010 was inadequate and uh, unhelpful. Um, I suppose my question is, what policies do you think would have been helpful and desirable for Europe to have followed, because that's something I didn't quite get. And that bears on the question of what uh, Europe should be doing now, but I don't mean uh, a more sensible policy, but what policies could and should Europe have followed that really realistically might have made a difference and might have improved things and helped prevent the explosion? I guess I can tack on a question which is, really not so much European, but has to do with this other part of the world, and it's something that you didn't talk about, but you must have thought about it. Um, in the entire region of the countries that have been touched by, that were touched by the so-called Arab Spring, uh, where the original protests weren't simply suppressed, wrap up. the only country where it has not turned out totally disastrously is Tunisia, at least so far. And I wonder if you have any ideas, which I'm sure you must have, why this is true. Why, relatively speaking, it's not so awful. Okay, thank you. I'm told we actually only have five more minutes, so I'm gonna take the last two questions, and then if I could ask each panelist to speak for no more than 30 to 60 seconds, that would be great. <laughs> the next question is in the front. A uh, quick question for really directed at our colleague uh, from Kuwait. Um, when you look at the UNHCR dashboard on who's subscribing to the UNHCR refugee appeals, 
Um, Europe is undersubscribed. Uh, but the Gulf countries, Kuwait accepted, I want to make that clear, Kuwait has subscribed $100 million to that appeal of when One I look. Billion. Um, and One billion. But the mm. other GCC countries, Saudis, have not. There's great criticism in uh, the West that um, the Gulf states and Saudi have not done anything uh, to help uh, the refugee situation in Syria and basically have waged a proxy war in Syria for four or five years along with some other people uh, that's made the situation worse. I just think I'd, I'd appreciate uh, your perspective on that criticism. Okay, and one final question in the back and then we'll turn to our panelists. Thank you. Sebastian Rollo from Suffolk University. Uh, my question is for uh, Minister Moratinos. I mean, you made a very eloquent um, speech about the need for diplomacy and, and the importance of diplomacy in addressing the, the problems that we've been discussing. Um, and you asked the rhetorical question of um, what is European diplomacy? And my question to you is why is it that European diplomacy hasn't worked and what will it take for it to become effective? Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, Sheikh Sabah and brief comments. Thank you. Um, <coughs> you're absolutely right. I think that we, uh, in Kuwait, we have done quite uh, a lot. We hosted uh, three donors conferences over the past two years um, to support the refugee problems uh, in Syria. Uh, we, uh, Kuwait, my country, has uh, contributed about a billion dollars, uh, $973 million to be exact. Um, and. Um, the rest of the GCC actually have done a lot, uh, not only in terms of financial support to the refugees, but also in accepting Syrians uh, within the GCC. We don't call them refugees. Uh, for example, in Kuwait, we have uh, 230,000 Syrians living in Kuwait, uh, working. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, they are about 600,000. So this, and, and the rest of the Gulf, in, in total, there are about uh, two million uh, Syrians who are working, <coughs> living in the GCC countries. Is that enough? No, it is not. Um, uh, the question whether we should uh, do more, uh, yes, absolutely. But we think that um, the conflict in Syria it's not, we are not the in initiator of that conflict. Uh, Mr. Bashar al-Assad, he waged a war against his people. And in, with the support of the Iranians, uh, who called in uh, their proxies, Hezbollah, uh, to move off from Lebanon into Syria. And now what is the most dangerous thing that's happening now is the Russians deploying forces. This would, again, as I have said earlier, this would recreate the drama of Afghanistan. Uh, it would cease to be viewed as a civil war in Syria, and it would be viewed as a Russian invasion of an Arab country. It would be very difficult. It, it would be a recreation exactly of what happened in Afghanistan. It would be very difficult to prevent people from all over the Arab, not the Arab world, all over the Muslims world to have this cry of uh, uh, jihad against the Russians again. And so we're going to have a, a replay of what happened in Afghanistan. And for that reason, I don't understand, actually, the uh, acquiescence to this Russian move into Syria. I think that should, there should be, uh, uh, we have objected very strongly in the Arab world. And I think that the Europeans and the Americans should object to that as well. Thank you. Thank you. I know it's hard to do justice to these questions so briefly, but we'll have to try. So, very quickly, on uh, East versus South, I can't agree more. I worked actually on a big flagship report on the transition in Eastern Europe. And I think we should not, we should be clear. It's not an opposition between the European, whether they would, should be taking care more of the Eastern <coughs> countries or the South. I think the, we are their neighbor, and we need really to work together. And we were extremely happy for what happened uh, in Eastern Europe. And by the way, if you look at the demographics of most of this Eastern Europe, 
for the south part of it where we have uh, an abundant labor and young people is an excellent market for us. The problem is we don't have the policy instruments to take uh, in a way uh, advantage of that market. So it's not an opposition, it's a complementarity and I agree with you that the Eastern European played a major role in the European economies. The, um, the inadequate policies if I know all the policies, I would have listed them and everybody would have known. Now, I think the, the issue is how to actually, in a way, formulate and design these policies in a sort of participatory way, the participation of other countries to see what is possible, what is feasible, what is not feasible. And that's fundamental because you cannot just come and open your market and have a sort of a <coughs> neoliberal approach because you want to have it on the other side. Now, we have a different level of development, different institution, and what is the political economy of reformers that I will, in a way, uh, take risk for? That has never been discussed. Now, on the political, I think I can tell you what are the policies. You cannot come to the southern region and say that you're going to be in a sort of neighborhood and these are the policies, and I agree with uh, Minister uh, Morris, I think he's absolutely right. When the region from the very beginning is leading with conflicts, you cannot ignore for decades the Palestinian-Israeli problem. And they put us in the same group, in the same room, to debate the, the economic policies and the political policies together. You can imagine that uh, more than half of the Arab minister representative left the room. So, and that happened tens and tens of times. So th there is, uh, how do you actually formulate, analyze, and formulate these policies with the uh, different countries? Uh, and, and, uh, the, the other issue is security. Security has always been a problem in the boards. We have never debated it, and I agree with uh, my colleagues here that that's something that needs to be looked at at the regional level and not the security of my borders. And I will see what happens in your countries and I will help you uh, here and there. So that's uh, my Thank take you. on this. Thank you. Uh, Minister well, Martin. I'll try to be brief. Uh, well, um, I raised also the issue of uh, Eastern partnership with Southern neighborhood. I mean, we are have been the one who support the police uh, you know, uh, move on the Eastern Partnership. I have, on the contrary, we need those <laughs> Eastern and Southern Partnership. And we are very proud to have a, a new member state from Eastern and Central Europe. My appeal, with all my respect, even if we have Ukraine war, even if Ukraine is bigger than, uh, with all my respect, that's my analysis. Mm -hmm. The complexity, the challenge in short, medium, long term for Europe will come more from the south than from the east. That is my condition. It doesn't mean that we should not have an eastern partnership. Of course. It doesn't mean we don't have a clear position on Ukraine. Of course. Of course we have. I mean, Europe have, uh, and I will uh, answer now to the foreign policy of the European Union. I mean, we are, you know, 28 countries. Hmm? We have uh, the best, uh, let's say, model in the world today, with all my respect to American friends. Why we should not have the capacity to have a foreign policy? Because we have instruments, we have uh, personalities, we have means, we have resources, we have diplomatic uh, people, but we don't have foreign policy. Thank you. Uh, Minister. Just a, a brief comment on, on enlargement, because I believe that uh, enlargement policy has been the most successful strategic move of Europe in the last uh, 20 years. It was very successful. We. Uh, stabilized uh, Central and Eastern Europe in a way that we never imagined could happen in the aftermath of 1989 events and uh, the 90 events. Where did we fail? In not having the same strategic approach to the Middle East. We never had it. And in that strategic uh, approach, we never had also the capacity to see how the stabilization of relations with Russia, of a framework of relationship with Russia on a strategic level, was so important also to address the challenges that we face in the Middle East. 
the problem of having now Russia uh, moving in such a way in Syria is also the result of the dynamic generated by an unstable framework of strategic relationship with Russia, where I think we did fail. Thank you. Please join me in thanking all of our panelists.